Hi everyone, Zach here, and welcome to lesson 24 of the series Learning C++ by Making Games. This is the last lesson video we have for our first iteration of our Hangman game, and in this video we'll be going over our switch statements. So in this video, we'll cover the syntax, what evaluations we can do, the cases, the break statement, and the default case at the end of a switch statement. So what is a switch statement? Well, a switch statement is a block of code that allows for a specific subset of code to be executed based on a value of a variable that's being evaluated. So if we have multiple conditions that we want only one of them or maybe a set of them to execute, then a switch statement allows for us to do that. So that said, again, multiple sections or a single section of code can be executed. Typically, and in our game, we'll be using single sections of code, but based on the use of break statements, which we'll cover later in this video, multiple sections can be executed based on a single switch condition. And switches are cleaner and more easier to deal with with if statements in some cases, especially in cases where there are multiple conditions that are impossible. All right, let's go over a simple syntax structure. So you see we have our switch keyword followed by something I've called a control expression variable name. This control expression variable name is the variable used to determine what case to execute. And we'll talk more about what you can put in there, but it's just a name of a variable that we're calling. And based on what that evaluates to, a different case will be executed. So we have an example of one case to nth case. We can have as many cases as you want. And what the expression in that switch statement evaluates to will determine which case to run. The case will then execute the statement. So we have three different examples at the top there and three different statements they could execute. And if you have a break, it will break from the switch and go onto the code underneath this final curly bracket here. If you don't have a break, it will fall through to the next statement. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. And at the very bottom here, you'll notice we have a default statement. Our default statement is an option catch-all like the else statement in an if-else structure. But the syntax can get a bit more complicated than this in terms of using statement blocks. So let's take a quick look at that. As you can see here, we have the same sort of setup. We have our switch statement, the control expression that we're evaluating, and then we have a block statement instead. So if you have multiple statements that need to be executed based on an expression, you're going to use this sort of block statement structure instead. You can also have a default here as well. I just chose not to include it due to space. What values can be evaluated by our switch statement? Most often, you will see integers or enums used. Do not worry about what enums or enumerations are. We haven't covered them in this series yet. We will cover them at a later point. However, that said, you can use any value where that value can be evaluated as an integral and constant expression or an enumeration type. Again, don't worry about enums and enumerations. We'll cover that at a later point. We're going to focus on that integral and constant expression for a moment. So what does this mean? Well, this means that integers work, of course, but so do other variable types where that variable can be evaluated as an integral expression. So for example, character types can be evaluated to an integral value as we saw earlier in this series. And continuing from that idea, you might use characters or the char variable type in selection menus, but you need to consider what happens when someone uses an uppercase versus a lowercase value as these are two different characters. Now we can solve this by using break statements in strategic places. And we'll talk about that towards the very end of this video. And next we have our cases. The case is the condition that is executed if the expression evaluated matches. The type must match the expression that is called for in the switch. So for example, imagine we declared an integer type num to a value of one. 
we could then have a switch statement that uses num, which is an integer type. Because we have initialized num to one, we would execute case one on this list. And we would get the output that says, this is case one. If we had initialized it to zero, if we had initialized it to zero, it would say this is case zero. Same for if we had initialized it to two, we would get this is case two. Just like loops, switches, can use break statements. And just like loops, a break will cause the switch to stop executing at that point, and it will break out of the switch and go onto the code below the final curly bracket of that switch statement. In addition, break statements prevent fall through. And we'll talk about fall through with a couple of examples in a moment. Now, break statements are completely optional. However, best practice says use them unless you have a really good reason not to. And we'll go over an example of this in the next slide or so when we talk about menu selection using character type variables. But let's look closer at follow through first for a moment. Now, imagine we had that code from our previous slide, but we didn't have any break statements. So we have an integer type, which we have declared and initialized to a value of one, and we have that same switch statement. This time we have no breaks, however. So what would happen if our num is one, and we were to execute this code, it, was, it would output one, two, three. It would skip case zero, because that would be false. We never evaluate to case zero. It evaluates to case one, so it outputs one. It doesn't know to stop. It goes on to the next case, and the next case, until we reach that final curly bracket. Now, let's say we had strategically placed break statements, because if it was case one, we also want case two to execute. What this would look like is that we had placed our break statements after case zero, two, and three. And if our integer type num evaluates to one, then we will output one and two. If it evaluated to two, it would output just two. If it evaluated to three, it would output just three. Same with zero, it would output just zero. So this is why break statements are important. Now, as I hinted at earlier, you might want to use character types, and that's completely optional, for a menu where a player selects a character to say what to do. Let's say Q is quit, and H is offer a greeting. Well, a capital Q and a lowercase Q evaluate to two different cases. Same with an uppercase H and a lowercase H. So what we can do is strategically place break statements. So regardless of which uh, letter type, uppercase or lowercase, the user enters, we will execute the vet, we will execute statements for that letter. So with our H, we have the capital H followed by no break sign. So if I type a capital H, it will automatically also execute the code for a lowercase h. However, if I type a lowercase h, it will only execute that code and we won't accidentally enter the case that is labeled as Q. Likewise with Q, they can enter either an uppercase or a lowercase code, uppercase or lowercase Q, and get the goodbye statement. And again, because of the break, it will break out of that switch. Next, we have our default case. Default, as I've already mentioned, is an optional case that you can put at the end of a switch. It must be the last case in your list. It cannot appear anywhere else. And the default case does not require a break. The default case is similar to the else statement in an if else structure in that it's a code that runs if no other case is true. In other words, if the expression evaluated did not meet any of the cases, this code is executed. It is useful to use the default case when you have a quote unquote default state that you want to have executed or when you want to do debugging. Because if there is no default state and they shouldn't see anything, this is a way to check if you're following through on your last case. This is a way to check if somehow the switch statement isn't being evaluated correctly. You can display something like, if you are seeing this, then this switch statement is not working. And finally, I want to talk about a C++ 7 update to the switch statement. This is also true for the if statements, and I didn't cover this there. Please note that not all compilers available support this, and to get a C++ 17 supported compiler for Visual Studios, there are a few steps you have to do. And I'll go over this in the next video. You go to your properties ribbon at the top, select 
project properties. Whatever you named your project, that name will appear. Go to your C, stroke C++, then languages, and in there you'll see your language standard. Make sure to set it to C++17. We are in the era of C++20 right now, however, Visual Studio does not fully support C++20. So, the update is, as I mentioned, you can include initialization statements in your switch and if statements. What this would look like is, if you said switch bracket int i equals 2 semicolon i. So you're initializing i as a local variable, and I'll talk about local variables in a later video for this switch only and you're evaluating the i statement so in this case what we would get is an output that says two all right that said we have covered everything we need to know to do our first full iteration of our hangman game we have our word we've made it a mystery word we are going to use switches based on the number of tries a user has to control which ascii version of our hangman we have so when they have six tries it will just be the gallows when they have five tries, it will be the gallows plus the head. When they have zero tries left, it will be the entire body. So that said, what I want you to do before going on to the next video is to try to finish out this version of Hangman. And if you can't, that's fine. You know, they're still learning. Come back and watch the next video, see how I did it. There are multiple approaches to this. So if your solution works, then hey, it works, good job. If you just wanna see how I've done it, go ahead and watch the next video. If you wanna make that comparison, again, watch the next video. And as always, if you've enjoyed this series or this video, hit the like button down below and you wanna make sure that you're here when we go on to iteration two, where we work with functions, hit that subscribe and notify icon so you know when those videos are out. And consider becoming a supporter on Patreon. As always, I look forward to seeing you in the next video and I hope that you have a wonderful day.